Okay, today is 5, 6, 15. This is where we start to talk about phase change diagrams. This is the other thing that is a big ACT booster. This is really helpful on the ACT. Um, it's, it's really simple, actually. All it is is a graph with temperature typically on the x-axis, pressure on the y-axis, and the phase where those that substance will be in the phase that substance will be in under the given conditions. Um, now, a couple things to note on a lot of these. We talked yesterday about scales and doing good visual estimates on scales and how, you know, humans are really lousy at doing anything other than half. Well, that's great. If you notice on the one that I've given you as an example here, the scale's not consistent. It's, and it's not even really logarithmic. I don't know what the heck's going on there, but like, this is from 1 to 218. Hoy! This is from 0.006 to 1. So you really have to be, you'll need a calculator to do visual estimates on this scale, um, you know, of looking at, well, what's, what's the half there? Well, what's the half there? Um, you, you cannot do these just off the top of your head. You have to use a calculator. Do a visual estimate, you know, cut the, the, the span in half, cut it in half again. Um, that's really tremendously useful. I mean, like, this is zero, this is 100, but then this is 374. Whoa. It's crazy. So you'll, you'll need to use a calculator and a ruler. Um, <clears throat> triple point exists on every phase change diagram. There is some point at which all three states of matter can exist in equilibrium. What does that mean? What does it mean if phases are in equilibrium? This is a review from a couple days ago. Let's do a little bit of review of equilibrium. I have water, I have vapor. So I have liquid plus heat, vapor. That's how we would write it at equilibrium. Explain this to me in terms of particles and their phase. If I start this system and it's at equilibrium and I have 100 molecules, I can't spell, in the liquid phase, and 50 molecules in the vapor phase. If I let the system sit there for an hour, but it's in equilibrium at the end of that hour, have any particles changed from liquid to vapor? Have any particles changed from vapor to liquid? How many particles at the end of that hour, if this is in equilibrium, do I have in the liquid phase? 100. How many particles at the end of that hour, if this is truly in equilibrium, do I have in the vapor phase? 50. So, one in, one out, they are changing places. They are changing. They are, they are transforming from one phase to the other. But the rates are the same. So the, the overall numbers don't change. If I have all three phases in equilibrium, what would that look like visually? So, don't yell it out. Give me a... but. I'm going to give you a few seconds to think about it. You can sketch something on your notes. I want a visual representation of what that would look like. What would a system where all three phases were in equilibrium look like visually? Who wants to give me a description? I'm, I'm drawing and writing on command here. So I've had one student instruct me to write the word solid there. I'm awaiting further instructions. I have been instructed to write these things. I await further instructions. We've, we've eliminated all the text, and I'm now being told to draw a, a glass container. About halfway down in the glass Okay, I am being told to draw little cubes about halfway down in the glass container. Anybody want to add anything here? <laughs> I'm being told to add liquid. Oh, I have to cap it. Okay. I was hoping you'd remember that part. 
closed system. These equilibrium systems are always closed. Okay. What else? Okay, I've got gas particles. That's what it would look like. Good. It would look like a closed system with liquid, solid, and vaporous water. And we've, we can draw, you know, the fact that these are particles. If we were going to describe the motion of the particles in here, what would be happening? Now, the, the problem I had with, with your instruction on the one, would you expect to see particles going directly from the solid to the vapor in here? No. Sublimation typically happens mostly at what? Very low temperatures and very low pressures. Um, here at the triple point we don't necessarily have, you know, we might have some. It's, it's pretty low it's above the freezing point of water, which is why the liquid water can exist. It's low pressure, but it's not terribly low temperature. Our most likely scenario is that we would have particles going solid to liquid, liquid to solid, liquid to vapor, vapor to liquid. And if we were going to write this as an equilibrium, a phase equilibrium equation, the way we wrote um, phase equilibrium for just liquids and vapors, we would be writing solid plus heat yields liquid plus heat yields vapor. And so these things are all transitioning. But it's, it's a straight line thing. We, we shouldn't see a lot of sublimation or deposition. We shouldn't see transitions. They shouldn't be jumping the liquid phase, in other words. You know, the liquid phase is present. Those solid particles aren't going to suddenly gain enough energy to go straight to a vapor phase. So you're, you're going to have <clears throat> more of this kind of relationship. Yeah, what's it going to look like? It's going to look like a glass with ice water. You know, a sealed container with ice water in it. But at certain conditions, we can get it to a point where all three phases are in equilibrium. So the number of particles overall doesn't change. The ice isn't melting. You know, this is not on its way to being all a liquid. It's not boiling off. It's not on its way to being all a vapor. It's not freezing up. The liquid is not on its way to being all a solid. Um, that's triple point. So, you know, the triple point... If, you know, one of the things that I could see an ACT question being structured around is um, under what conditions of temperature and pressure would all three phases be in equilibrium? Well, they're expecting that you know the concept of triple point. They're not asking you, where's the triple point? But they're asking you, based on the definition of triple point, you know, what conditions would get you to triple point? Um, the phase diagrams are fairly straightforward, honestly. If you can read a graph and you can do those kind of visual assessments of graph scale that we talked about, you should be able to answer most questions. Um, I will tell you that I tend to ask questions like, you know, changing from this condition to this condition. So you have to locate two points on the graph. Uh, you know, what phase does it start in? What phase does it end in? What's that transition called? So you have to know your transitions. Um, th those are some of my favorite questions. Okay. Okay. So critical point is the other um, important piece of these. Above, so there are two things. There's critical temperature, there's critical pressure. Once you get above critical temp temperature, you cannot liquefy, a, you cannot condense a substance. Above, there is, for every substance, there is some temperature above which you can't force it into a liquid phase. doesn't matter how hard you push on it. doesn't matter what kind of pressure you put it under. The temperature is too great. It cannot exist in a liquid phase. Um, and if we look on this one, there's the critical point, which means that this is the critical temperature, and that is the critical pressure. Okay? So, again... You need to know, and, and I could ask a question like, at, you know, that's 374 Celsius. At 400 Celsius and 
you know, X pressure, what state is this thing in? Well, you have to know that above that critical temperature, it doesn't matter what you do, it can't liquefy. It's going to always, always, always be a vapor. Um, and you, you got the normal boiling points for substances off the vapor pressure diagrams. You can also get them from a phase change diagram, and you can get the normal freezing point. So norm, when we say normal melting and boiling, we're talking about basically at roughly normal atmospheric pressure. So, you know, at 760 TOR um, or 1 ATM, depending on the scale you're in, that's what we mean by normal boiling and freezing point. Um, you know, within a couple thousand feet of sea level, for instance, you're not going to get enough of a change in boiling point to matter. Even, like, so today we're up at 770. It's a high-pressure kind of day. Um, that's not going to change the boiling point of water much. I mean, will it? Technically, if you were using the most sensitive, well-calibrated instruments you could to measure the temperature of water as it boiled, would a day with high atmospheric pressure yield a slightly, what, higher or lower boiling point? Higher pressure, higher pressure, higher boiling point. Um, yeah, not so that you'd notice when you're making your spaghetti. Um, it's not going to make a difference for you. Okay, um, water. We like it. So water does a couple of interesting things. And because of the interesting things it does, we have this lovely little, um, well, we have, life has evolved the way it did on this planet largely because of the chemical structure of water. I mean, we've got the whole location, location, location thing going for us. Um, you know, not too hot, not too cold, Goldilocks, we're in the Goldilocks position planetarily. But water does some interesting stuff. So you all know water's a Mickey. We have our little hydrogen ears, our little oxygen face. And when you built molecules in your molecular geometry lab, you measured this bond angle. Whoops. You measured the angle between these two bonds. And you, you probably got a reading of roughly uh, 105. Um, that's about as good as you can get with a student protractor. It's actually 104.9 degrees. I have it in here. Yeah, 104.9. Um, so, okay, great. Yeah, everything has a bond angle. What of it, Moser? I'm going to ask you this question. When we vaporize liquid water, is the resulting vapor more or less dense than the liquid water was? So is steam more or less dense than liquid water? Pardon? Less dense, sure. Yeah, gases are almost, they're always less dense than their liquid counterparts. We move those particles further apart. Okay. I mean, for any substance on the planet, right? We vaporize it, it's less dense. If I take molten steel, okay, big flaming hot pool of, you know, 3,000 degrees steel, and I solidify it. Is the resulting solid more or less dense than the liquid? More dense, sure. If I, if I, have, if I happened to have access to an Olympic-sized swimming pool full of molten steel, which would be a fearsome thing to see, and I took cubes of solid steel and I dropped them in, what would they do? They'd sink to the bottom. They're more dense. Okay, good. If I take liquid water and I solidify it, is the resulting substance more or less dense than the liquid? What? It's less That's crazy. That's the silliest thing I've ever heard. Solids are always less dense than their liquid counterparts, right? Oh, yeah, they're always more dense. Sorry, whoops. Um, solids are always more dense than their, the liquid of the same material, right? Because we move the particles closer together. So when you put ice cubes in a glass of water, they sink to the bottom, right? What do you mean they float? That's ridiculous. If they float, that would mean they were less dense. And that's crazy talk. Or is it? Okay. How possibly... Because, in fact, they do float. 
Um, if they sunk, the Titanic wouldn't have. Um, I thought that was kind of nice. Um, yeah, solid water floats in liquid water. How is that possible? Because we know that when we solidify a substance, we move its atoms closer together, and therefore it is more dense, and therefore it would sink in the liquid. How is it possible that solid water floats in liquid water? Okay. That bond angle in liquid H2O is 104.9. But something really weird happens when you get Mickey cold. When you chill poor little Mickey, I'm going to copy part of this. When you chill poor little Mickey, his ears do something weird. And I express it to you in these terms because I have actually seriously remembered it in these terms for as many years as I can remember. Whoops. When Mickey gets cold, his little ears lay down a little bit. Now, I am over dramatizing this, it's not that extreme. But Mickey's little ears go when he gets cold. And I, like I said, I'm telling you it that way because I have literally remembered it that way. This bond angle in solid water changes, and it is no longer 105, 104.9. It's now 109, 109 degrees, which means that one molecule of solid water takes up more space than one molecule of liquid water. So the same number of molecules, the same mass, take up more space, which makes it less dense. All because Mickey's little ears can't take the cold. So that fact, well, that enables a lot of things to happen. I would invite you to think about what would happen if solid water sank in liquid water. Okay, so the Titanic wouldn't have sunk. And that might be nice. Anybody ever go ice skating on a frozen pond? What would happen to ponds if solid water was denser than liquid water? Well, the, the ice would form, sink to the bottom, which would continue to cool the thing, and you'd have a feedback loop, which would ensure that they all froze solid, top to bottom. Um, yes, all animal life in that pond. <clears throat> yeah, no little frogs buried in the mud, no little turtles buried in the mud, no ice fishing, no swimming under the water for the little fishies, swimming in the cold, cold water under the ice. No, 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 no. Dead, 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 dead. So happy, happy little thing we have here that solid water is more dense than liquid. Um, it is the only substance known to humankind that does that. Huh. Pretty cool. Um, and it's a change in bond angle. So water also has a really high molar heat of vaporization. It takes a lot of energy. It's got an unusually high heat of fusion and heat of vaporization. It's got strong intermolecular forces. Remember we said that there are two intermolecular forces working in water? What are they? Name one of them. Jot it down. Don't yell it out. So we have hydrogen bonding. And we also have whoo, um, dipole forces. And those two things, you've got two sources of intermolecular bonding there. So water tends to stick together really well. Um, remember, water's only attracted to two things in the entire universe. Itself and everything else. Yeah. And it's really attracted to itself. It's rather a narcissist, honestly. I think water's going to prom as its own date. Okay, so that's it. We're going to do a, a quick FIP quiz over um, vapor pressure diagrams. And tomorrow I will have a quick phase change diagram quiz for you. Um, Monday is your big quiz. I guess there's no homework. You know what? Let me assign some practice, some homework for this chapter. Um, just because, I mean, not a lot, but a few problems to, to help you out with this. Um, on, this is the chapter review for chapter 12.
basically number 37. Number 37. Number 12 through 15. That's it. So that's the homework. This will be due, let's see. 37, 12, and 15. 37, 12 through 15. Yep. 12 through 15, and then number 37. Um, some of those conceptual, some of those... The, the one is a graph. Um, okay, so I guess these will be due... Well, shoot, I really have no choice. Today's Wednesday. I would love them to be due Friday and go over them and grade them. You guys will not be here. Okay, so these will be due Monday. You'll take your quiz then Tuesday. Okay, that's it.